appreciate Brother Jonathan uh, filling in today for us on the piano in the absence of Brother uh, Matthew. And again, pray for them. They're headed back to town today. Um, well, at this time here, I think we're just going to our sermon. So we appreciate that. And uh, we'll have uh, an invitation him at the end. Well, take your Bibles this morning. And if you will, turn to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Page 300 in your Living Application Bible, amen? Number 300. And if you've got a Schofield Reference Bible, it's page 259. Joshua chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 1 down to verse number um, 9. Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And the Bible says this, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, <clears throat> Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. That great sea would be the Mediterranean Sea. Verse 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Now notice what's happening here. Moses has died. Joshua was his second in command for almost 40 years. And he has been trained and, uh, and he has uh, been uh, vetted for this uh, position of taking over as the commander, basically, and leader of the nation of Israel. Approximately 2 million people, they say, uh, at this time. And so what God's doing is is the Lord speaks unto Joshua, verse 1, and he is promoting him. He's promoting him from number 2 to number 1 here. And it's, it's, if you will, it's promotion, it's a graduation, if you will, also. So this is the Lord's graduation sermon, amen, to Joshua. And this is going to be the Lord's graduation ser uh, sermon to the young people here this morning. Um, he says there in verse 6 to Joshua as he takes command, he says, Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. He says, I want you to obey the commandments of the Lord. But he said, if you're going to do that, verse 7, he said, you're going to have to be strong and very courageous to do that. You're going to have to be brave and have courage. Verse um, 7 again, he said, only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. God promises prosperity for those who will obey him. And we're not talking about financial success. We're talking about just success in life. Amen? Uh, you may uh, be just a regular person who, you know, maybe you make $75,000 a year and other people, you know, make $200,000 a year. You know what? You're both prosperous if your bills are paid and you got food in the house and you got gas in your car. Amen? Amen. Um, you're doing pretty good. So success is not determined by your bank account. Amen? Uh, look at verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Notice he says you'll make your way prosperous if you'll do what God says, and you'll have good success. Verse 9. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Amen. 
Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, for the opportunity we have to uh, follow, stand today and preach the word of God. We thank you, Father, for each one that's come and attended today. We thank you for our members. We thank you for our visitors today. We thank you for the family and friends of the graduates this morning. And we pray particularly for the graduates today that God, uh, you would speak to their hearts this morning, that their ears would be open and their hearts be open, God, to uh, biblical advice. We pray, God, that you bless them in the future. May they live lives that will glorify you. And we'll thank you for all that you do in Christ's name. Amen. Now, taken from this text here, and again, uh, this passage of Scripture that we've read uh, could be called God's Graduation Sermon. Joshua, again, is being promoted to the highest position in Israel, and he's succeeding Moses, who has just died. Uh, before this time, Joshua was under the authority of Moses. Now that Moses has died, Joshua is under the direct authority of God, with no intermediate authority. And so now Joshua is going to be directly accountable to God for his decisions and his actions. In a sense, uh, you that are graduating, and uh, we could call this a charge to the graduates, which means I'm talking to the graduates, I'm talking to Isaiah, and I'm talking to Samantha, and I'm talking to Ben, amen? So you all can relax, because I'm preaching to three, these three people, amen? <laughs> but uh, we're gonna, you're, you're going to get something too, amen? But... Um, uh, this means that uh, uh, for the Christian, that you'll be under the direct authority of God and directly accountable to Him. Not only did Joshua have a change in position, but this change was a natural development. God had been grooming Joshua over the years, approximately 40 years, to take on bigger challenges and greater responsibilities. Joshua had followed in the steps of Moses, and now he's going to fill his shoes, so to speak. And the leaders of today will be passing away tomorrow, and someone's going to have to fill their ranks when they're gone. Amen? And so you young people and other young people that are graduating, literally the future is going to be in your hands. And I simply say, God, help us. Amen? Amen. Uh, because uh, there's a lot of people graduating that probably don't even deserve the diploma they're getting these days. But... Uh, I'll tell you this, I'll tell you one story real quick, and that is one day I went to the credit union to borrow some money, and uh, they, uh, this is 25 years ago, 25 years ago, I went to the, uh, to the credit union to borrow money, and I uh, put down what I wanted, they, they, they took the uh, form, they set it in front of me, and there it was, one page form, and I got my pen out, and the lady said, now, you fill in here, and you put this in here, and you sign your name here, and you date it here, and I said, lady, I can read. <laughs> and she said, oh, I'm sorry. She said, you would be surprised how many people come in here that can't read that. I thought, you know what? If you can read, you're going to be at the head of the class, you're going to be the head of the corporation, because we got a lot of dummies running around these days, amen, that graduated high school and college. So, so anyway... Um, so the leaders of today are passing away, and we're going to need some new leaders to come on. We're going to need some new political leaders, business leaders, uh, you know, uh, uh, school leaders, church leaders, and things of that nature. And so at some point, you may be called of God to do something like that. But in any case, moving along here, I want to tell you this here. Here's a question. How can you be ready? How can you be ready? Uh, how can you be successful in life and prosper in the world? And so the title of the sermon is simply this, How to Succeed in Life. How to Succeed in Life. Now, I know what I'm saying here. Hopefully, uh, uh, you're listening. Hopefully, you'll take this stuff in. Uh, most graduation sermons and charges and things like that, many of them are very boring, and you just want to get it over with, and uh, you don't remember anything that was said because you graduated high school, and you've got more important things to do. Amen. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, if you'll give me the next few minutes, I'll give you some stuff I hope that'll help you, and maybe you'll remember it in 10 or 20 years and put it in practice if you don't do it sooner, amen? But here you go. Uh, how can you be ready? How can you be successful in life and prosper in the world? Well, generally speaking, put God first. Matthew 6, the Bible said in verse 33, he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he said, All these things will be added unto you. God said, put me first. He said, I'll take care of you. 
If you'll take care of my business, God says, I'll take care of your business. Amen? That's basically what he's saying. Put the Lord first. That's a general truth. Uh, but secondly, or specifically, let me say this, you need to apply some biblical principles to your life and your living. You've got to apply some biblical principles. And I've got five biblical principles here, I believe, that will help you and anybody else, amen, that wants to be successful in life. Let me say this first of all. Uh, you need to have plans with a purpose. You need to have plans with a purpose. Uh, no doubt you've got dreams for your life. No doubt uh, uh, your future, you may have it mapped out in your mind, a course that you'd like to take in life. Uh, they may include college, they may include a career, they may include marriage, uh, and all kinds of things that you want to do in life. You've got some dreams you'd like to do. I hope you're not dreaming about living in the basement with mom and dad for the next five years, amen? Uh, but in any case, uh, you ought to have some dreams, you ought to have some ambitions to do some things, amen? Maybe you just want to be just a normal, everyday average person, that's fine, Amen? If that's your ambitions, I hope you succeed at that. But um, Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs chapter 16, the Bible says this. It says, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Psalm 37 says, Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. So the Bible says if you commit your works and your thoughts to God, uh, then you'll be established. And if you commit your way unto the Lord and trust in him, he said that God will bring it to pass. Amen? Let me say this. There's a lot that may ask you this question here. Uh, how many of you are exactly where you thought you'd be 30 years ago? <laughs> All right. How many of you are or not where you thought you'd be in 30 years. Okay, how many of you are better off than you thought you'd be in 30 years? All right. So not where, not, not where you, you, you may start someplace and wind up in an entirely different place, just simply by the providence of God and the guidance of God in your life. Because you know what? We don't always know what we're doing. Um, that one verse I read there, I believe, uh, said... Uh, um, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him. He'll bring it to pass. Oh, here's the verse. verse Proverbs 16, 9. It said, A man's heart devises his way. That is, a man's heart plans for his dreams. But the Lord directs his steps. So you may have a dream. You may have an ambition. And you may be headed towards that goal. But you may wind up someplace else under the direction of God that will be better for you than what you thought. Amen? You know what? Because God's smarter than you and me. That's why. But in any case, all these things, college, career, marriage, etc., these are all well and good, but uh, it's good to have plans. You've got to have plans, but you have to have a purpose behind those plans. Or you may fail instead of succeed if you don't have a purpose that's driving you to accomplish your plans. Amen? A purpose gives you a reason to carry out your plans. It gives you the drive you need to fulfill your dreams and stay on track. Uh, one question we could ask is this, what is the purpose behind your plans? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you thinking about doing what you're doing? I don't know what you're going to do, but why are you thinking that way for? He said he needs the money. That's a good thing, amen? If you don't have money, you can't live, you can't buy, you can't have anything, amen? You've got to depend on other people. So that's a good, that's a good purpose is to make money. Um, now, let me say this. The ultimate answer should be this. To fulfill God's will in your life that he might be glorified and people drawn to Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the number one goal of a Christian. Amen? Amen. I don't care what your career is going to be. I don't care if you're married or single. I don't care if you're a missionary or not. I don't care if you get in the ministry or just a layman in the pew. You know what? Your desire ought to be, your purpose ought to be, to fulfill the will of God in your life for you and to glorify Him so that people would be drawn to Jesus Christ. That's the purpose that God saved you and I for. Amen? And if we don't live... With that in mind, with that purpose in mind, then our plans may come to nothing. Amen? Your plans ought to be God's plans for your life. Let me say this. 
Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane just before the crucifixion. Um, he was surrendered to the will of God for his life. And we should, like Jesus, be surrendered to the will of God for our lives. And we ought to pray as the Lord did there when he said, Nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. We want God's will to be done in our life. Now you say, well, I don't really have any specific you know, uh, directions of what God wants me to do. Well, just take one day at a time, amen, and do what you ought to do today, and tomorrow you'll be where you should be tomorrow, amen? You just keep doing that day after day, and eventually you'll wind up where you're supposed to be, amen? Uh, Isaiah 43, God says this, Everyone that is called by my name, I have created him for my glory. So if you're called by the name of the Lord, if you're called by the name of Christ, the Lord says, I have created you for my glory. Amen. Not your glory, but His. Amen. Ephesians 1.12 tells us that we who are believers should be to the praise of God the Father's glory of us who first trusted in Christ. So if you've trusted in Christ as your Savior, you as a believer ought to be a person who desires to be to the praise of the glory of God. Amen. That's your purpose in life. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 tells us this. Paul asks this question. He says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? He's talking to a carnal church. A church that just doesn't really have it all together spiritually. Uh, they're kind of carnally minded. They're, they're interested in things in the flesh more in the spirit. They've got a lot of issues and problems and things there that Paul has to address. Uh, the book of Corinthians is God correcting a lot of problems in that church as far as their doctrines concerned and even how they live. And so when Paul gets to 1 Corinthians 6, he says to these people, he says, What? Don't you know that your body is the temple, the Holy Ghost, which is in you? And you have it of God and you're not your own? You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. If you're saved and born again and you claim Christ as your Savior, you know what? Your body ain't yours, amen? It don't belong to you. It belongs to God. He bought it. Amen. Your spirit doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. You belong to God, amen? He purchased you on the cross of Calvary with His blood. He owns you, amen? You're His servant. He is your master and your Lord. And he says, I want you to glorify me in body and in spirit. I want you to go, it'd be like this, I want you to glorify me in your body, so come to church. And then he said, I want you to glorify me in your spirit. Come to church with a good attitude. Amen? Amen? Body and spirit. Uh, John 15, Jesus said this, Here is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. Jesus said that if you're going to Glorify the Father, then you need to bear fruit. Much fruit. What kind of fruit is that? Are you talking about growing fruit trees out in your backyard? No. He's talking about fruit in your life. Amen? And that fruit would be the fruit of the Spirit. When you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit, you get the fruit of the Spirit. God gives those things to you. You know what you get when you get saved and get the Spirit of God that indwells you? You get love. You get joy, you get peace, you get long-suffering, you get gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. All those things you get when you get saved. You know what the world's looking for? They're looking for love in all the wrong places, amen? amen. They're looking for joy in all the wrong places. Uh, they're looking for peace in all the wrong places. Hey, the place to find love, joy, and peace is in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, amen? Um. And so that's part of the fruit. Then there's also the fruit of souls, I believe, and that is uh, you and I being able to win other people to faith in Jesus Christ. Um, one of the old catechisms said this. It said, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy His presence forever. That's the chief end of man, to glorify God and to enjoy His presence forever, here and in the hereafter. Amen? I mean, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. And you ought to be happy in Jesus, amen? And you ought to be one who uh, can experience the love and the joy and the peace of God and uh, the presence of God in your life. So whatever your plans may be, you've got to have a right purpose back of those plans. And that is to bring honor and glory to God and His Son. 
Because that's what you were created for, and that's what you were saved to do. Amen? Every one of us in this room, that applies to us. Let me say, secondly, not only have plans with a purpose, but you ought to have a purpose with preparation. A purpose with preparation. We mentioned there that Joshua was prepared to take over this position. He was prepared. He might have in his mind had plans, thinking, you know, all these years, you know, I've been with, I'm at the right hand of Moses all these years. I'm just assuming that God's going to put me in his place when he's gone. He might have those thoughts. And uh, he probably mentally was preparing himself for that over the years. What happens if Moses dies? I'm probably going to step in and take over. See what he did? He made preparation over all those 40 years that he was with Moses. He made preparation. And you've got to be prepared. And that means to make yourself ready in advance for a particular purpose. If you're going to be prepared, that means you're ready to go at the moment. Amen? That means you don't have to get prepared. You don't have to get fixed up. You don't have to organize. You don't have to pack. I'm already packed and ready to go right now. Uh, I don't know if it's true or not. Brother Jimmy can verify this, but I picture Brother Jimmy at the fire station on the second floor with the fire pole there, his boots by his bunk, and his clothes there. He just jumps out of bed, just, just falls into the clothes and the boots, and then slides down and gets on the truck. Amen? That's what you do, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that's all we need to know. <laughs> amen, amen. That's what he does. I've seen it on TV. That's what he's done, amen? So, you know, he's ready. He's prepared at any moment, amen, to do what needs to be done. Uh, in First Chronicles 22, it says there about King David that he prepared to build the temple. Prepared to build the temple. That means he got all the, all the he, he went down to the hardware store, amen, got everything he needed down there. Uh, he uh, ordered everything he needed, you know, from uh, the other countries around that had the supplies he needed. He got everything prepared and ready to build the temple. And um, the temple there was the place where God met with his people. The temple. Amen. And you know what we are? We just read a while ago. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? This is the temple, this body you live in and walk in and breathe in. This is the temple of the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost lives within this body. It's a temple. And you know what? David prepared to build the temple. You know what you need to do? You need to prepare to build a life. Amen. Because this temple is what you're going to live that life in. And so you need to build this life and be prepared to do so. So whatever you want to do in life, you've got to be prepared in order to succeed. Uh, most, people, most people don't just fall into good luck and make it. I mean, every person that you've read about, heard about, saw in the newspapers or in the, in the, you know, uh, on TV or the news or celebrities and stuff, oh, she's an overnight success. He's an overnight success. And they'll all tell you I was an overnight success after about 10 or 12 years. Right? I remember Chuck Norris. Well, remember Chuck Norris? The Walker, Texas Ranger thing, you know? And somebody told him one time, he said, man, you're so lucky. He said, luck had nothing to do with it. He said, I worked 10 to 12 and 14 hours a day, six days a week for 10 years to do what I did. He said, luck had nothing to do with it. You know what he did? He made his own way. And what you're going to do, you're going to have to make your own way too, Amen. If you're going to succeed in life, you're going to have to prepare in order to succeed. Just even have a church service. Guess what we have to do? We have to prepare. You prepare to come here. I prepare to come here. I've got to be prepared to preach a message. Amen? You've got to be prepared to listen to it. Amen? You've got to be prepared to stay awake the whole service. You may have to go to bed early last night so you can stay up this morning. Amen? But you've got to prepare whatever you do. When you go to your own job, guess what? You've got to prepare to do your job when you get there to your office or get there on the field or whatever. You've got to have your equipment ready. You've got to have your notes ready. You've got to have all the, you got to have your paperwork ready. You've got to have all that stuff ready uh, because sometimes you know, you've got to get it done, right? To get it done, you've got to be ready. So you've got to be prepared. Uh, Bob Jones Sr. used to say the best preparation for tomorrow, get this now, the best preparation for tomorrow is to do what you ought to do today. Amen? Amen. You know what I did last night? I ironed my shirt last night. So I had to do it this morning in case I got caught up in something and had to come in a wrinkly shirt. Amen? Uh, 
So anyhow, you got to be prepared. You got to prepare ahead of time to be ready to do something that you want to do. Uh, so let me ask you this: Did you do what you should have done today? Were you faithful in your duties and obligations and responsibilities today or this week? Uh, were you faithful in your Bible reading, in your prayer time, in your church attendance, in your witnessing? Were you faithful to do your homework, study for school and test? Were you faithful to do your chores around the house? Amen? So I'm 18 years old. I ain't got to do chores. No, you ain't got to look at the house anymore either. Right? I didn't get no amens on that one. Uh, do you work as unto the Lord? Do you treat your family right? Those are some things that you need to do every day. Amen? The Bible says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. He said, whether you eat, drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. It goes back to purpose, amen? And so you've got to be prepared to do that. Uh, you've got to prepare your heart, your mind, your body, your soul to glorify God. You've got to be prepared morally and spiritually and mentally and physically to serve and glorify God, Amen. Hey, God doesn't really want dummies. He wants people that use their minds, amen? God gave you a brain. He gave you an intellect, amen? To use and to develop. To do what? To glorify Him. Um, you ought to, let me say this. You ought to get the education that God wants you to get in preparation. You ought to get the education where God wants you to get it from. And you ought to get as much education as God wants you to have to do what He wants you to do. Um... Some may go to a secular state university or a junior college or a trade school or straight into the workforce and just do good old on-the-job training. Amen. Uh, by the way, not everybody needs a college degree, but it never had, hurts to have one on your resume. But you don't have to have a college degree to make it in life. There's lots of people that have good-paying jobs that don't have a college degree. They're at the right place at the right time, and they learn stuff that on the job that you could learn in college sometimes. And so, you know, whatever God wants you to do, go that route, pray about it. Uh, again, not everybody needs a college degree, but it never hurts to have one. Uh, let me say this. Always consider a Christian school for your education. Always consider a Christian school for your education. A Bible-believing education at a Christian school. If you're going to, you know, it's too late for high school, but, you know, if you're in high school or a younger person, I recommend that you put your kids in a Christian environment, in a Christian school. And if you're going to go further education, I uh, suggest that you consider and check into Christian colleges and see if they offer what you need to do what you need to do. Why? Because the secular colleges are going to try and tear down your faith. They're going to try to get you not to believe in God, not to believe in creation. They're going to try to turn you into a bunch of atheists and evolutionists. That's what they're going to try to do. Uh, now, not everybody in those schools is that way. I understand that. But that's just the general attitude of the world in college. Amen? There's a lot of people that go to state universities and colleges and city colleges stuff like that, that are Christians, that are saved, that go to church, have good morals. But for the most part... They are not the ones that are setting the tone for education and morality in those places. And it's unfortunate that many people just simply go to college just to go party. Amen? And get away from home and just go wild and go crazy and then wind up in trouble. Uh, we'd hate to see that happen to anyone here this morning. Amen? Amen. Um, so be careful about where you go, who you listen to. Who trains you? And also, I put in that book there something about creation, something about the King James Bible, and those are in there for you as a resource. And that Bible that I gave, it's got plenty of resources in there about the Bible and the truth of it. But uh, the world out there is, go is going to attack the Bible. They're going to attack your faith, and they will attack you. And if you're not courageous, like the Bible said, and strong and of a good courage, you're not going to make it with those people. And you may wind up in a situation where you walk away from the faith, walk away from church, walk away from Christianity, and you become some kind of an agnostic or something, or some kind of a weakling type of a Christian who can't speak up for what they believe in. 
And we don't need those kind of Christians, amen? We need some strong Christians. And we need you to be a strong Christian. And I'll guarantee you this, God wants everyone, including you, to be a good, strong Christian, amen? And to know what they believe and why they believe it. Uh, the psalmist wrote this in Psalm 119, one of the verses in there, he said, he said this about education. He said, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation." David said, I've got more understanding than all my teachers. Let me say this. If you believe in God and you believe in the creation that God made and you believe in the Bible, guess what? You have got more understanding than most of the teachers that you'll have in a secular college. And you need to keep that in mind. Uh, you might be able to help them out as opposed to them corrupting your faith and spoiling your faith. Uh, I remember one time when I was in the Air Force, I had to go to uh, NCO Leadership School at Edwin Air Force Base. I remember going there, and uh, I just got my sergeant stripes, and so anyway, I had to go to this class. Um, and so as I was going to that class, and some of the things they talked about was, um, they talked about um, um, something to the effect of, uh, you know, all religions are the same. What's that got to do with NCO Leadership? All religions are the same. We have to treat people, you know, blah, 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 whatever, you know. And uh, at some point there, you know, the guy said, you know, somebody said, well, what does Genesis mean? What does Genesis mean? And he said, well, Genesis means evolution. How many know what Genesis means? It don't mean evolution. It means generations. It means beginnings. It doesn't mean evolution. So anyway, after the class, I went with this guy. And I spoke to him. I said, look, I said, you know, I said, I heard what you said there. And he said, I, you know, I said, I appreciate the good things you're teaching us. But I said, I believe you got that one wrong. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, Genesis doesn't mean evolution. It means beginnings. It doesn't mean evolution. The Bible teaches creation. He said, oh, I didn't know that. He's a professor and Christian. Didn't know that. And he's just teaching the curriculum. I said, well, I said, you know, I said, what's being taught today is what's called secular humanism. Uh, atheism, evolution, autonomy of the individual, you know, a couple other things, whatever. And it's all based on, you know, man is the measure of all things, and, you know, God, you know, we don't, God has no say in your life because God, you know, if he's there, it's not interested. If he's there, then you're not an atheist. And so, anyway, I bought him a book. I gave it to him. He took it. He read it. He said he really liked it, enjoyed it. He'd never heard that before. So that was... 40 years ago, 35 years ago, he'd never heard of that, and yet Christians were talking about those things all over the place in that day and age. But he, he missed it somehow. And uh, so, you know what? I had more understanding yeah. than he did on that, and I was able to help him to get understanding of that. It wasn't because I was proud. It wasn't because I was cocky. It was just simply because, you know what? This fellow here has got it wrong, and he needs to have the right viewpoint on life. But again, I was prepared for those attacks. I was prepared for those, uh, you know, falsehoods being thrown out. And I was able to combat it and to help somebody come to an understanding of what the truth was. Amen? That's the whole point of it. Um, now, uh, one of the, a, a president of Harvard University said this, no one can claim to be educated unless he has learned the Bible. That's a Harvard professor. Probably not a modern day one. Uh, William Lyon Phillips, a famous uh, professor at Yale and also a president of Yale around 1900, 1910, somewhere around there, he said this. He said, I thoroughly believe in a university education for both men and women, but I believe a knowledge of the Bible without a college course is better than a college course without the Bible. Amen. Why? Because there's a lot of things in the Bible. There's a lot of truth in the Bible. There's history in the Bible. There's archaeology in the Bible. There's science in the Bible. There's, there's biology in the Bible. There's prophecy in the Bible. There's doctrine in the Bible. Uh, you take the Bible, you can go over there. And Napoleon took the Old Testament and used it as a road map when he went through uh, Egypt and the Middle East when he was trying to conquer the world. You know why? Because the Bible was accurate. He found the places. He visited the places of the Old Testament of the Bible. Why? Because it's geographically true. And it's spiritually true. And so if you study the Bible, it's more than just memorizing the 23rd Psalm in John 3.16. There's a lot more of the Bible than just that. 
Uh, but anyway, you've got to have a purpose with preparation. Uh, the great British poet laureate, Sir Alfred Lord Tennyson, said, quote, Bible reading is an education in itself. One of the most educated and prominent and, uh, and uh, celebrated Englishmen of all time said, the Bible, reading the Bible is an education in itself. So don't let anybody talk you out of your Bible, amen? That's what's going to get you prepared for the battle ahead. Uh, one preacher said this, he said, prior preparation prevents poor performance. Think about that. You know why sometimes you see somebody with poor performance? In other words, no prior preparation. That's what it was. They didn't do their homework. They didn't make preparation for what they needed to do. So you got to have plans with a purpose. But if you have a purpose, you also need to have preparation to fulfill that purpose. Let me say number three. Uh, if you have preparation, you should have preparation with principles. Preparation with principles. You can have a good plan with a good purpose, with good preparation, and you can fail to succeed in life if you don't have the right principles. By that I mean an honorable code of conduct. An honorable code of conduct. There are certain things you will do. There are certain things you will not do in life. Uh, the Bible says that no man or woman is crowned except he strive lawfully. In other words, you're not going to be crowned with success unless you do it lawfully. That means you do it right. You're going to have to live life right if you're going to truly succeed. Uh, you can be the best in the game, but if you cheat, you lose. Amen? If you don't win fair, you don't win at all, they say. Uh, even good motives don't justify wrongdoing in order to do good because the ends never justify the means in God's book. And honesty is always the best policy. That's some codes of conduct there. If you want some real codes of conduct, get George Washington's rules of etiquette. <laughs> by, that, by that measure, we're all some terrible sinners, I'm telling you. But you've got to have preparation with principles. Uh, but again, don't be naive. Uh, living by right principles is going to cost you. You simply have to do right and trust God to bless you and don't fret thyself against the evildoers because there are going to be those out there whose ministry and whose purpose is to bring you down. There's some people the Bible says they can't even sleep at night because they're sitting there thinking and planning and scheming how they can destroy you because they're not really your friends. Amen. You can think about that. Uh, you think about some people that... Um, had plans, they had purpose, they had preparation, and they had principles. I think of Moses. Moses had money, he had power, had education, had prestige. He had a future on the throne of Egypt at one point. But when he came to a crossroads of conscience in his life, he refused his earthly privileges and he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God. You know why? Because Moses had principles. Joseph, he was in charge of the house of one of the most powerful men in Egypt, an army officer. Well, he refused to sin, and it cost him his reputation and his freedom. He was falsely accused of a crime and unjustly condemned because of one who despised his goodness. Uh, Joseph had principles, and he would not sin against God by sinning with that man's wife. He wouldn't commit adultery. You know what he did? He had principles. It cost him two years in prison. For doing the right thing. But then later on, we'll get to that. Then you got Daniel, another man. The Bible said he purposed in his heart not to defile himself. Daniel was about 17, 18 years old probably. When he was uh, taken uh, captive by the Babylonians and removed from his home and his surroundings. And uh, basically imprisoned and made a slave. And uh, when uh, they said, okay, we're going to change your... Jewish clothes to Babylonian clothes. We're going to change your Jewish diet to a Babylonian diet. We're going to change your Jewish education to a Babylonian worldly education. Daniel said this. He said he purposed in his heart not to defile himself with all that worldly stuff. And he refused to partake of the world's food and drink. And he risked his life in doing so. And by displeasing the king and the government and the powers that be. Why did he do that? Because Daniel had biblical principles. He had Bible convictions about things. He said, there are just some things I don't do. 
and he didn't do it. It cost Moses 40 years in the desert. It cost Joseph two years in prison. It cost Daniel in the lion's den, and among other things. Each of these men had principles that they chose to live by and were prepared to die by. And you know what? The Lord blessed each of these men and promoted each of them in the world that they refused to submit to or give in to. Moses became a leader of Israel. Joseph became the number uh, two man in Egypt. Uh, Daniel became the number three man in Babylon in the world's government. You know why? Because he refused to go along with it. And when they saw that, you know what they saw? They saw a man with conviction and honesty Amen. and integrity and said, you know what? He may not believe like we do. He may not agree with us on a lot of things, but you know what? He can get the job done. Amen. And we can trust him. Because he had principles. You're going to be tested on your principles. They're going to test you what you believe, what you'll do, what you won't do. You're going to be tested on those things. Um, so I say this. God will do the same for you as he did for those men. He'll honor you if you'll honor him. Let me say this. Number four. Uh, you can have a good plan. You can have a good purpose. You can have proper preparation. You can have the right principles. But you can still fail at life if you don't have the power to accomplish your plans. You've got to have power. There's all kinds of power in the world. Political power. Economic power, physical power, military power. Uh, power is what enables you to do things. Power is what enables you to accomplish your plans. And uh, power is what enables you to get the job done. Uh, for instance, uh, electrical power enables you to cook, to wash, to clean, to see, to watch, to search the internet, to stay warm in the winter and cool in the summer. You know what the Christian needs? He needs spiritual power to accomplish the will of God in his life so that he can get things done and accomplish in life. You've got to have spiritual power to do spiritual things. The Bible said in 2 Timothy 3, 5, Paul wrote this. He talks about those who have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. There's many a person who claims to be godly, claims to be Christian, but they deny the power to get the job done for the Lord and get the job done in your life. Uh, right outward living based upon biblical principles is mere formalism and empty religious habit if you don't have the power of God to add life to it. And that power is the power of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah, God said this, he said, It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord host. It's the Lord's power that is going to give you what you need to get the job done. A race car needs power. A boxer needs power. Without power, they might look good, but they can't do anything. Amen? Brother Ron's car looks good sitting out there in the parking lot. Amen? Amen. If he don't have any power, he ain't going nowhere, though. He looks good. The car looks good, amen? But he's not going anywhere. A lot of Christians like that. They look good. They dress right. They talk right. They smell right. They seem right. They do what they're supposed to do, and etc. But it's like there's no power to what they're doing. They have no impact with their life. Why? Because they're missing the power of the Holy Spirit. They're not yielding to the Holy Spirit. Now, where does power come from? It comes from fuel, it comes from fire, it comes from water, it comes from nutrition. And you've got to have the right fuel to get the power going. Uh, you can't put diesel in a gasoline engine. And you can't put kerosene in a diesel engine. Amen? won't work. It won't work. You've got to have the right fuel to put into uh, the vehicle to make it work. The Bible talks about Jacob and how he wrestled with an angel of God back in Genesis 32, and he prevailed with that angel. It was a typifying prayer, and he overcame that angel to get his prayer answered, and that angel of the Lord, which was actually a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, said to him, he said, you have power with God and with men. That's what he said about Jacob. you got power with God and men. You know what you need? You need power with God and men. If you're going to have, if you're going to accomplish the work of God and the will of God for your life. For the Christian to have power, they need to have the right fuel. That would be faith, prayer, and the word of God. Those are the things that fuel the power of God in your life. Amen. So read the Bible, pray, 
and have faith in God, amen, and trust Him in, on a daily basis. And then finally, let me say this. Uh, you say, oh, I've got a plan. I've got a purpose. I've got preparation. I've got power. I can check all those off. Let me say this. You need one more thing to cap off success, and that is perseverance. Perseverance. Um, that's old-fashioned grit and determination. That's the things that keep you going in spite of opposition and setbacks and disappointments and all the world can and will hurl against you. You need perseverance. Uh, perseverance is just simply, I'm just going to do it because it's right to do, and I know I need to do it, and I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. Um, the Bible says that a diligent man shall stand before kings. Um, you know what you have to do? You have to patiently endure to keep plugging away and don't quit even if you feel like you can't go on. You've got to live by faith. And faith is really active, an active conscience, conscious trust in the Lord. It's a moment by moment trust in God uh, that He's going to get you through. Amen? And He's going to fulfill His end of the bargain. Uh, many of life's failures are people who quit too soon. How many of you know people that quit before they should have quit? Before they could have made success? Many people don't realize how close they were to success when they gave up. Uh, some folks stopped trying when they failed, but most folks fail because they stopped trying. So the thing is, don't quit. Persevere. Don't quit. Uh, the su successful person keeps on trying, and they make a way. The unsuccessful person, they quit trying, and then they make excuses. There's people all, over, all around you that make excuses for everything wrong in their life. In there. Well, that's, this, they did me wrong. They did me wrong. She did me wrong. He did me wrong. You know, I tried my best, but, you know, I failed. This, that, and blah, blah, blah. Well, maybe you did fail. Maybe you're not going to be a success in some things in life. But you know what? You don't have to be a failure just because you lost a battle someplace. Amen. Um, the successful man is the one that gets back up. Again, falling down doesn't make you a failure. Staying down makes you a failure. Uh, I saw <clears throat> I saw a uh, clip of two boxers. I don't remember who they were, but they were two bo boxers. They were in a ring, and they were in a boxing match for some championship. Well, the one per the one boxer got knocked around. And he got knocked down about three or four times within one round. Within one round, he got knocked down three or four times. Each time seemed to be the last one, but he kept getting up, even though each time he got up successively was more slowly. He finally got up on nine and a half, you know, the last one. But he got back up, amen. Even though he couldn't. Go on, he still got up to go on. Why? Because he was just built that way. He said, I'm going to persevere. Then he got his fourth or fifth wind after getting up after the third or fourth time, getting knocked down. And with a flurry of punches out of nowhere, he knocked his opponent down and out for the count. Nobody saw that coming. He didn't see it coming. His opponent didn't see it coming. But you know what? It came. You know why? Because he persevered. He got knocked down once, twice. Three times, maybe four times in that round. Then he got up. He was a new man when he got up that fourth time because he was thinking, you know what, I'm not going down on number five. I'm not going down again. And he just took that guy out in about ten seconds. That's perseverance. Uh, one man said it's usually the last key, um, it's usually the last key on the, on the chain that unlocks the door. Isn't that right? It's the last key on the chain that unlocks the door. So you've got to be patient, you've got to endure, you've got to persevere. So you might have to go through 10 or 12 keys to get the right one, and it's usually the last key. Yep. Amen? In life, it may be that way. Charles Spurgeon said this about snails. He said, by perseverance, the snail reached the ark. <laughs> Think about that, amen? He made it. Uh, Bob Jones Sr. wisely said, the successful man or woman is the one who finds God's will and then does it. And he does it because he perseveres. And I'll close with this here. There's a tombstone on a mountain somewhere in the memory of a climber who died as he was trying to climb the 
peak of that mountain. Inscribed on the tombstone are these words. He died climbing. He fell off the mountain. But the tombstone says he died climbing, not falling off the mountain. Yeah. See what you got to do? Keep climbing. Keep going. Don't stop. Don't quit. Persevere. Amen. Endure to the end. Amen. By the grace of God, we all can do that. Amen. So that's my admonition to the young people this morning and everyone else as well. Let me say this also. The most important thing, we didn't mention this probably already, is are you saved? Yeah. Are you a Christian? Are you in the family of God? Are your sins forgiven? If you died today, would you be in heaven or hell? Where would you be? And the answer is, if you know Christ as your Savior and your sins are forgiven, you'd be in heaven. If you don't know Christ as your Savior and your sins aren't forgiven, then God has no choice but to condemn you because of your sin. God's already taken care of the sin problem. The problem now is the son question. Your sins have been taken care of. That problem's over as far as God's concerned. The question now is the son question. What will you do with Christ? Will you accept him as Savior or will you reject him as Savior? Eternity depends on that. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Brother Jonathan will come play as a hymn of invitation. Let's bow our heads for a moment with you, if you will. Eyes closed, heads bowed. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and we thank you, God, for the opportunity we've had to come to church this morning. We thank you, Father, for the freedom we have in this country, Father, to worship you, Father, according to the dictates of our own conscience. Uh, we thank you, God, uh, for being able to uh, open a Bible and preach from it and preach what we believe is the truth of it. And, Father, we pray you might bear witness to the truth of your word even this morning. And, God, I pray that uh, the admonitions and the advice and the counsel that was given today from the word of God uh, would find a place in the hearts and minds of each of these young people here today. I pray for Isaiah. I pray for Samantha. I pray for... Um, Ben, Lord, that God, you would uh, lead and direct them in their lives, uh, that they might uh, seek to glorify you, and that, God, you would bless them in their lives and their future. Father, we pray, God, for everyone else here today as well. There's things that we talked about today that we can all understand, we can all relate to, uh, that, God, there's, there's some things in our own lives, God, that maybe we haven't succeeded like we think we should. Uh, these things would help us. We pray, God, you might help us, Lord, even... Uh, if we're older, to take these things to heart and apply them to our lives. And God, if there's anybody among us, of course, who's not saved, their sins aren't forgiven, they're not ready to meet you, we pray, God, the Holy Spirit would convict them of that, show them their need, make them feel, Lord, their need and their guilt before you, and help them to realize that Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself on the cross of Calvary, died for each one of us that we might be saved. And, Father, he's not willing that any should perish and be lost, but that all should be saved. And God, I pray if there's anybody here, Lord, that you're dealing with, that, God, they would come to Christ and trust him as their personal Savior. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. With their heads bowed and their eyes closed while he plays this invitation to him, this is a time of prayer and of our service just to consider what you've heard this morning. And if the Lord has spoken to your heart about anything, whether it be salvation, be a backslidden condition, whether it be a discouragement, whether it be doubting your salvation, whether it be uh, just you need encouragement today to keep going on for the Lord. I hope that you got today what you need. I hope the Holy Spirit of God will bear witness to the truth in your heart, to you personally, about what your need is today. And I hope that you will submit yourself to the Lord and His will for you. Just pray for a few more moments before we dismissed. Let me ask you this question, no one looking around. Is there anybody here who, in your heart this morning, you believe that the Lord is speaking to you about your need of salvation? and accepting Christ. If there's somebody here today like that, and you like looking around, if you'd like me to pray for you, I would be glad to do that. Nobody's going to embarrass anybody or call anybody out by name. If you're here today, you believe that God is dealing in your heart about your need of accepting Christ and being saved. Would you 
playing for us this morning. Amen. Amen. Appreciate each of you coming today. Appreciate our, especially our visitors being here today uh, to come and uh, support your uh, family and your loved ones here today that are graduating. And uh, we have uh, dinner and refreshments in the back there, so I hope that you can stay for that uh, and enjoy uh, a good meal with us this, this afternoon. But again, thank you for coming. Uh, pray for these uh, young people. Encourage them down the road uh, and uh, help them Help them to make it. Amen. We all need help. Amen. We're going to be dismissed in prayer this morning. I'm going to ask uh, uh, Brother Chuck Bedford if you would please dismiss us in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the service today. We pray for those that couldn't be here today and are traveling. Uh, we pray for those that are uh, maybe not quite 100%. We pray that you might put your healing hand on them. Thank you, Lord, for this great service and we pray that you might lead our, our young people to Amen. lead and, and uh, just just live fine lives for you. May will be done. May you bless this service. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed. <laughs>